Welcome to this video and I am so pleased to welcome Professor David Nutt. Professor, thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure, John. So far anyway, let's see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Now, I became a registered psychiatric nurse a few weeks after my 21st birthday. <laughs> oh, wow. Th th things went a bit sideways after that, but uh, that's what I did when I was 18, 19 and 20. So, uh, yeah, pre pretty, pretty uh, happy memories, really, for, for most of it. Um, but you, you, you're a doctor, you're a psychiatrist, you're a professor, you're an academic, uh, you're a writer, <laughs> and uh, you're, to be quite blunt about it, a world-leading expert in uh, psychopharmacology. So tell us a little bit about yourself that you think might be relevant, and what the heck is psychopharmacology anyway? Well, it's a, it's a word you've already mastered, which I'm impressed <laughs> But then that, that psychiatric training, uh, yeah, yeah. As, a, as, as, a, as a... If you learn, if you learn when you're young. Yes, quite. Mm. Oh, so psychopharmacology is the study of drugs, how drugs affect the brain and mind. And um, I got interested in it really f almost from my very first day at university. Uh, I, went, I actually went to university, I thought I was going to do physiology and I was going to work out new ways of treating pain using... Uh, improvements uh, on electrical stimulation but my mentor at the university at Cambridge was a, a guy he, he was the guy that discovered GABA in the brain right and and it was at the time when we, we were rewriting the whole science of the brain from essentially being a telephone exchange where everything was electrical to being some sort of soup of chemicals which somehow pulled things together he discovered GABA we and and the concept of synaptic transmission and neurotransmitters was just developing and mm. and then of course if you given the fact that the brain works through use, utilizing maybe up to 80 different neurotransmitters to understand those you have to use small molecules we call drugs so then I got interested in drugs and and you know I haven't solved it all yet so <laughs> I can't take it. You know, I've been doing it. It's a massive, massive task. But uh, obviously, yeah. mental illness, it affects addiction. And it affects other areas, you know, like enhancement and well-being, etc. The brain and the mind, it's just so ludicrous, isn't it? You know, I've been thinking about it since I was 18, as you have. And the, the analogies that are used are often those of the, the technology of the day. So sometimes it's a telephone exchange, then it became a digital computer, yeah. uh, th then it became some quantum machine or other. But it's just, it's just utterly unbelievable, the, the, the sheer complexity of it. I don't yeah. know, 100,000 million nerve cells with hundreds well, of interconnections each. Well, yes, it's actually, yeah, it's, so it's, um, I think the current estimate is about 80 billion yeah and uh, and each one's like a little computer but mm. it's our it's the analogy of the brain really is not a computer analogy it's analogy is with humankind mm. yeah it's the, the the brain is is so powerful because in the same way as human you were powerful because we were if we work together we could be extraordinarily powerful and we have yeah. the technology if we, anyway. yeah. if, if, if we could and uh in, in a sense you many aspects of humanity emerge from the brain this this emergent consciousness that comes from the oh yes presumably comes from the brain <laughs> I, I don't think there's any doubt about that yeah we don't understand yeah, yeah. it i'm sure it, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think i mean obviously there are people who think it comes from elsewhere and mm. there's no way you could ever say no but i think it's quite likely unless we're part of some very sophisticated game that some so someone beyond the universe is playing i think it's probably coming from the brain well, one thing I'm pretty sure about having worked with anaesthetists is we can switch it off for a period of time. That's uh, yeah, that seems pretty pretty convincing evidence, actually. Well, that, that is also true. Yeah, but what's interesting, of course, John, is and that's we will come on to this later. Is that yeah, until recently, the theory of consciousness was you can switch it on or off. It's whether you are awake or asleep. Mm. Now, of course, you know we've got these wonderful new drugs called psychedelics, which just change. The direction of consciousness as opposed yeah. to whether there's a lot of it or not not so much of it on the topic um i have just finished reading your book Fantastic. Um, eminently readable i must say um if you're um whatever you're you know for, for nurses and doctors fine for you know bricklayers painters and decorators also fine eminently readable and and, and in clear english Thank you. and uh i must say i I've been looking forward to this because my 
understanding of psychedelics is is very primitive and i'm hoping you're going to clarify that but just before we go on to that what, what common psychiatric disorders do, do you come across as a psychiatrist what causes this mental distress that seems so prevalent in our world at the moment well yeah i think it's important John, to, to, as you when you were doing psychiatry um you were th you were i presume in a hospital were you yeah, yeah, it was, it was a proper old-fashioned asylum. It was the end of the asylum days. Where, where was that? Yeah. Uh, it was Garland's in Carlisle, Cumbria. Oh, okay. I, suspect, I strongly suspect you've never heard of it. <laughs> I've not heard of it. You're quite, <laughs> no. you're quite right. I've not heard of it. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Been, yeah, but so there were, I've been in many like that, of course. Yeah, for sure. Mostly gone. But there, you know, you were seeing people with, with in, you know, often very enduring and very complex and very distressing serious mental disorders and for which you know we had you know, little in the way of treatments and today we still have limited treatments but then there's the much bigger that's like the tip of the iceberg underneath there's there's as you point out this distress and misery and unhappiness which is you know becoming some ways more pervasive and that's yeah. Whether that whether you know whether it's useful to talk about it as mental illness or whether we should talk about it in some other way, I think is a bit of an open question. It's um, it, it's certainly something we need to think about and try to help people with, but I don't. I'm not sure labelling it mental illness is is, is necessarily going to help us because then yeah. it kind of constrains a little bit. If it's illness, you've got to have a treatment. And whereas, you know, you and I, of course, are really we be definitely want prevention if we could. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think there's anyone watching this this video who's not suffered periods of what whatever we want to call it mental suffering exactly uh, psychological distress yes or, or or close family members who've been through really difficult times and and, and of course we can't really separate in in some respects different parts of the body you know the the, the mind and the body are so mm -hmm. um, interrelated if you're suffering physically you're going to be suffering mentally as well that, that's a component of the pain and of the suffering well, you and I know that. Unfortunately, sadly, a lot of doctors don't, and that's one of the things. You know, is, mm. there is. They still make fun of us doctors. They make fun of us psychiatrists. You know, they don't know what we do. They think we're. Are you just a doctor who's scared of blood? <laughs> well, <laughs> sometimes we're worse. Sometimes we're the thought police. Sometimes we're shrinks. You know, I mean, it, yeah, yeah. It's some, but the, but on a serious note, the point mm. you were making is that a lot, lot of doctors either through ignorance or even sometimes even kind of malice don't want to think about the psychological constructs they they and that's actually can we can, we, can i be honest with you that's why Please. i started off being a neurologist because mm -hmm. i thought you know that a it was difficult and b you know it was a, it was a real challenge understand the brain uh, and then i realized that um <laughs> I was. I worked on a the what we would call a sort of tertiary third third level neurology unit in St Mary's Hospital, and there were people there with very serious neurological disorders, but they were all much very similar to each other. You know, I mean, epilepsy. We couldn't do much about it. Multiple sclerosis. We couldn't do anything about it. But the, the people that we could do things about were the people who came in who had psychological distress. And that psychological distress had manifested itself in things like blindness or paralysis or mm. other, other, you know, unsteadiness. And then what would happen and, and would be that the neurologist would say, would work out, this is not a neurological problem. Leave the ward. And I, <laughs> yeah. hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. This is not a problem. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. we are, A, it's a problem and people need help. But B, that's actually very interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. if someone can be paralysed from the waist down because their mind makes them, yeah. wow, that tells you something way more about the brain than you guys can tell me about when, when you just have a lump in there. You know, I mean, it, 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 was, it made me realise that the brain's way more powerful than yeah. even neurologists give it credit for. And I, I can really relate to what you're saying. We get patients in, I worked in intensive care for a period of time, patients in with overdoses. Yeah. And basically the aim was to get them out as soon as possible. Yes, <laughs> there was no no holism. No, why did they come here in the first place? And uh, no, I think to the to the list of problematic doctors, we could probably add politicians, but we, we might talk about that. <laughs> we might talk about that later if you'd like to. Um, yeah, well, 
I'm just getting. I, well, let's let's not ruin the conversation to start. No, let, 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 let's keep let's keep the mind the mind clear. So I think were you talking about conditions there that are hysteria, historic hysterical conditions? Yes, that's what we would. I'd understand that. But, but that's what we would call them. Yeah. But but just to be absolutely clear, that's an utterly pejorative term. Hysteria yes. comes from, I think, the Greek word for the womb. So hysteria was things that women had. Well, how insulting is that? I mean, how utterly insulting yeah. is that? Well, it was caused by the floating uterus, wasn't it? That's right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wandering womb. Yeah. Yeah. Men couldn't have it. I mean, I mean well, as well as I mean, utterly insulting to women, but also... Totally. You, uh, now we call them conversion disorders, and, you know, and, and, you know, well, I suspect we've all had minor, minor uh, elements of that. Can I give you an example? Please. So I broke my ankle really quite badly seven weeks ago. And it's still not healed. I'm, luckily, I'm sitting, not talking, not standing. Um, and what, what, it did several things to me. The first is my blood pressure went up 20 millimeters systolic. My sleep mm. disrupted by the pain. But now, and I found this the other day when I was in a conference talking to, with people about um, pain syndromes. When people talked about their pain, I got pain in my body, not just in my ankle. I'm thinking, this is fascinating. You know, I'm empathizing with their pain, but I'm more able to do it now because I'm in pain myself, which was, which to me, very, very, you know, I've been around, I've been a doctor for 40, 50 years. That was the first time I personally experienced what it is like to have that body response to someone else's pain. And it was, uh, it made me you know, feel quite humble and made me think a bit more about, what we should be training doctors to be sympathetic about because it you, you you could you could if i went to a doctor they say well you know that's just in your mind but it is in my mind but it's come from the fact that i did have a physical problem in my, in my leg and still do well it's the interaction of of, of the the mind and the body and, and the experience is real it's, it's, it's a genuine pain it's... yeah dissociating them is one of the big problems we have in this in in science and, and in medicine is it so much of what the way we think about everything is in terms of what the words mean. We use language; it's often a very imprecise language. Uh, it often link, li locks people into a way of thinking, which isn't, you know, is constrained and, and 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 possibly wrong. And yeah, and that's that is really you know the idea. You know, there's a there's a mind and, and not a body. They're, they're separate. I mean, it's utterly ridiculous. Mm. We've got to be much more holistic. Yeah. So coming back to medications, what medications, what has been the main development in psycho psychiatric medications, say, since the Second World War? I mean, I, I seem to remember drugs like chlorpromazine, the major tranquilizers, came in probably about 1957, late 50s. Yes, that's right. And then tricyclic antidepressants. Well, yeah, I mean, it's the, the sad truth is that, that in the 50s, modern psycho modern therapeutic psychopharmacology the med modern medicines of psychiatry were discovered by accident yeah and they were drugs like chlorpromazine which were made to be sedatives but did turn out to be have some antipsychotic effects and then there was the first antidepressants which amipramine was actually mm. made to be a better chlorpromazine but it had no antipsychotic effect but it it did have a, a antidepressant effect mm. and then it, alongside that came the benzodiazepines as, as sort yeah. of tranquilizers they're all discovered completely accidentally and then made available as medicines and then certainly for the uh, the the antidepressants significant side effects of toxicity emerged and so people began to refine them and get rid of the toxic elements but today you know i'm still if i was still writing prescriptions which i'm not anymore but if i was i would be writing prescriptions for the same class of drug mm. I wrote my very first prescriptions back in when I first started prescribing in 1972 and no other branch of medicine really are you relying on medicines which have got you know are that old and have that you know not been improved in that time yeah it seems to me the changes are incremental so we went from the tricyclic sort of fairly non-specific drugs to the selective serotonin yeah. reuptake inhibitors so it's kind of a bit of a tweak really yes um, we went from uh, Phenothiazine antipsychotics to slightly more refined antipsychotics, but yeah. my understanding is they work in essentially the same way. Is that correct? They all work the same. In fact, in some ways, we went to less refined ones, but <laughs> we went through a cycle of refining and then de-refining yeah. because the refined ones had more side effects in the. Yeah, 
Well, we, of course, it's very, it's very important to keep drugs in patent so the pharmaceutical industry can make. Well, that Things is from part, patented drugs. Yeah, I mean the, the 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 Me Too concept has dominated, really dominated the this whole the, the whole psychiatric yeah. development field, and, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's it, it is partly that the system is very much um, it very much favours that because because. Once one has got on the market, you know exactly what trials to do to replicate. So, so you know, you just basically just do handle turning to do the same thing. But I mean, to be fair, it's also it's also been that, um, that even if you were to invent these, these, these medicines, currently are quite inexpensive. So there's very little incentive to to come up with new treatments. Mm. And uh, I mean, in fact, that's the point I've been making recently that that without any incentive, no one will. So. Mm. If the model is that companies need to make money making drugs for, for mental illness, and the companies are not going to make money because they're, so they're not investing, we've got to do something differently, which is why we've got to look to other lines of evidence, particularly in relation mm -hmm. to things like psychedelics, where the evidence base is enormous, um, but there isn't particularly a commercial way of, um, of developing it. So let, let's do it differently. Let's decide. Yeah. Let, we need yeah. a bit of a breakthrough, don't we? I, th I think that Me Too thing may be... Uh, is maybe got a few meanings these days i think what you mean in that context is like right. a drug like, like ssris yes, yes. and you start off with prozac and then you get citalopram and then you jiggle the molecule and you come up with sertraline and um, you just maybe tweak the molecule just a little bit yeah. and call it something new yeah but they all work in exactly the same way yeah i mean they yeah. have some differences but they're yeah. not they're very much as you say incremental advances and mm. and, and, and a, and it's also, they've been very successful and companies have made quite a lot of money out of them. So there's, it, it's been difficult to persuade investors t to do something different. You know, yeah. Why? <laughs> I mean, to, to the absurd situation now, John, this, uh, this, is, this is kind of fascinating, but there is one company now that is make, remaking a drug which was, is 50 years old. Yeah. It's a kind of benzodiazepine. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's been used in france for 50 years and uh, it's pretty safe and uh, and quite well tolerated but obviously they can't patent that so they're making a uh, instead of putting they're taking some of the hydrogen molecules out and putting a, a, a heavy hydrogen called deuterium so they're making a deuterated version of this molecule now because they can get a patent and you think well guys guys we've got a, we've got a powerful if this drug is good which it might be i have never used it as a french drug why don't we just make it available very cheaply for everyone rather than <laughs> rather than make a more make a version just simply so you can sell it i mean it just it, it the medicine is just, you know the has to, the profiteering in medicine has distorted logic the, you know surely I mean, we should be putting our knowledge to making something new rather than a, a new a version of a 50 year old drug Deuterium's heavy water, isn't it? You remember the heroes of Telemark and all that. Those stories right. from the Second World War of, of right. the heavy water. It's not radioactive, just so be, just so we can reassure people. <laughs> oh, that, 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 I am, I'm slightly reassured. 